Okay, so it's my pleasure to welcome everybody back for the afternoon session. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Joseph Emerson from Quantum Benchmark, who will be giving as our next talk. Um, as usual, please place all questions in the Slack channel in session seven, talk one, Emerson. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, great. All right, well, welcome everyone. I hope you're all well, and thanks to the organizers for, I think, putting together an amazing effort to get this rolling virtually. So I'm going to tell you today about uh, work we've been doing for the past few years, um, uh, mainly uh, from, the, from our startup, Quantum Benchmark. Um, and the goal here is to develop tools that uh, can help experimentalists and engineering teams improve their quantum computing hardware. And that we've been um, doing, um, been quite successful with. And then, and the other uh, challenge is we're uh, taking up tool, developing tools to allow users to improve the hardware <laughs> directly. And I'll tell you and understand how it's performing and how to optimize implementations. And we're very excited about this because in the end, even when experimentalists do the best they can to tune up a device, uh, it gets out of tune pretty quickly. Um, there are certain trade-offs and they just can't fix certain errors. So we're developing a software layer for the NISC era and looking towards the fault tolerant era to provide uh, better capa quantum computing capabilities. And the key to that is to understanding you know, what, what errors are occurring and developing tools to overcome them. So, um, uh, you know, the talk at, at times gets a little bit technical, but just if you want a take home message, the idea is that you're uh, trying to navigate the waters of quantum computing and they're icy waters. And we have all these icebergs floating around and uh, we have to navigate amongst them. And the, um, the key is that um, we have what we can see on the surface of the water, which are kind of these error rates we see from simple tools like randomized benchmarking. Um, and the, what we're discovering now is that randomized benchmarking is inadequate. Well, <laughs> okay, it was something we've been advocating for a while, but, but now we're showing this explicitly that randomized benchmarking is really just showing us the tip of the iceberg and the actual crosstalk and correlated errors that limit performance in the NISC era and that are absolutely necessary to understand in the uh, fault tolerant era are, are the true challenge. And um, our goal here is to introduce cycle benchmarking, which helps us navigate that challenge. And the point here being that just like every iceberg has a distinct shape, every different combination of gates you want to apply in the context of an application um, is going to have a distinct error profile. And so, you know, there's not a one size fits all solution to understanding errors. We have to really get into the specifics of what's being done and how the errors change as we change what we're doing. Uh, how is the audio? Can everyone hear me okay? Does anyone want to jump in? <laughs> that's, that's, that's hard to interpret that silence. Um, well, everybody says the audio is fine. Okay, great. All right. So, um, let me minimize this. So the point that I just made is, is uh, elaborated a bit on this slide. People think about errors in a channel, but which channel? So it's not enough to identify errors. It's not enough to have an efficient mean of, means of assessing errors. The trick is tying the errors to the, to the control. So, so we want to avoid this notion of errors as some kind of uh, noun that can be used without a, without a descriptor. So it's errors tied to this gate or that gate or this idle qubit under that gate. Uh, what we've discovered, we've, we're working with, I think just about every leading experimental group in the world. And uh, what we were discovering is that errors on remote qubits can sometimes dominate and of course depend on the, the nature of the gates being applied. So what I mean by that is you might be applying a controlled knot on qubits six and seven, and the worst error in your system is not the errors on qubit six and seven that are experiencing the control knot. The worst error in your system might be qubit two, which is supposed to be idle. And the error on qubit two is induced by the waveform you're using, the pulse you're using to implement that control knot on six and seven. So this is something that randomized benchmarking absolutely doesn't see. This is the iceberg beneath the surface. And, and cycle benchmarking is the tool we've developed to diagnose these errors. I'll tell you more about that. So what is cycle benchmarking? Well, it's a protocol. 
It's um, borrows ideas from uh, randomized benchmarking, from symmetrized error characterization, uh, with an old paper of mine from 2007. The idea is to um, identify some gate combination of interest, which we call a hard gate cycle. So in this figure, what's in the pink block labeled with the G tilde. So G, G is the ideal sequence you want to apply. So this might be like C naughts on qubits on some pairs of qubits and you know, T gates on other qubits. It's some parallel instruction set. It's some moment in time, which we call a clock cycle. Some people call it a layer of the computation. So any given application will be composed of many of these distinct hard gate rounds. And uh, the idea is to characterize the errors associated with each of them. So the way we do that is we embed that specific hard gate round, that parallel instruction set inside a, a uh, benchmarking sequence where it's randomized with these blue gates. So these blue gates are local poly gates. Uh, that's a special case. You can develop the theory for other uh, local groups. Um, and here we're just focusing on single qubit poly operations. And then you, you repeat that M times in length and that's to remove, it's one of the tricks to remove spam. You amplify the errors and then um, the randomization here inherits the benefits of dynamical decoupling and that uh, you know, kills off non, many non-Markovian errors and kills off coherent errors, which I'll describe more in detail later. And then the green, uh, are, the green blocks are carefully chosen local rotations also to remove uh, spam errors associated with leakage into different ir irreducible representations. The, gray, the grayed out box, which is the hard gate round followed by the random local gates, we call that a dressed cycle or a twirled hard gate round. And so the idea is that when we characterize errors in, in almost all implementations, the, two, the, the hard gates are the dominant error source and the single qubit gates are an order of magnitude uh, more benign in terms of the errors they produce. And so we think about the error associated with this block as being addressed hard, the errors on the dress cycle. This is the native way the hard gate round will appear if you use randomized compiling, which you should use. And I'll explain, show data for why you should be using randomized compiling later. And so it ends up giving the in vivo characterization of the errors on that gate sequence. So there's a little something for everyone. So when you're using cycle benchmarking, the information you get, about, get out about the error profile flows into a, a variety of different um, applications. So you reconstruct the errors in what's called the poly channel, which I'll describe later. You find these off gate errors for each distinct cycle. You can use that for global tune up and calibration. You can try and design better pulses that have less, uh, less impact in terms of the errors. Uh, you can use it in NISC applications to optimize circuit trade-offs and to do something which I'll describe at the end of the talk, which we call error adaptive compiling, which is works even better than we'd hoped. And uh, if I don't get to that, ask me that, about that in the question period, because that's a really exciting new, new application. And then of course it's relevant to fault tolerance. People talk about fault tolerance being beating a number, beating a threshold. It's much more complex than that. You have to make sure that the errors satisfy a very long number of assumptions, a very long set of assumptions uh, the, you know, the errors have to be uncorrelated. They have to be, sometimes they have to be depolarizing. Each fault tolerant threshold, the good thresholds make very strong assumptions on the noise, that it's very well behaved, that it's, a, that it's a depolarizing channel, that it's Markovian, that it's uncorrelated, and so on. And so how do you check those assumptions? Well, that's what cycle benchmarking lets you do. So now a little bit of math for error channels. So a very general error channel, if we assume we have a Markovian approximation on the time scale of the gates, we can model the noise by a completely positive map. Uh, and then the, um, we can describe uh, that completely positive map by this chi matrix formalism. The P alpha and P beta are poly operators, which is an operator set that spans the Liouville space uh, for the set of completely positive maps. So we just have a linear map and we can represent it in this poly Krauss picture, uh, which is also called the, 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 uh, the poly error channel. It, sorry, excuse me. You can represent in this chi matrix picture or a general channel. If you make the assumption that you have a poly error channel, an assumption which is enforced by randomized compiling, that kills off the off diagonal terms in the chi matrix. So you're just left with this poly Krauss picture where you have some lowercase p sub alpha as the probability weight, the classical probability of error P alpha occurring. And P alpha spans the set of, the, of tensor products on n qubits of the single qubit polys. So 
can be an X error on qubit one, a Y error on qubit seven, identity on qubit eight, you know, whatever you want. The important thing is that a poly error channel does not have cross terms in the chi matrix picture and cross terms are associated with control errors or coherent errors, which are in fact the dominant errors in the across hardware platforms today. So the beautiful thing about the Kali, poly cross model is the simplicity of it um, and it is not physically natural. So physical errors associated with control have these off diagonals. Uh, by using randomized compiling, we force the noise to appear to the user as in this form. And I'll describe that more. So you just have this two to the two n-dimensional probability vector. And an important message is that, um, you know, CP maps are linear maps, which means we can just represent them by matrices. Um, and so this is called the Uville matrix, uh, where you just basically rep write the, use the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product and construct the matrix elements of the, the error channel. Um, and then you have this natural composability property uh, and this is sometimes called the poly transfer matrix. When you choose the basis of operators B as the poly operators, it's called the, the poly transfer matrix. And then because you just have a matrix under certain conditions that matrix will be diagonalizable, namely if it's normal. And in fact, if you have a poly error channel, then you have a diagonal, uh, the diagonal basis is the poly basis. And this is in this vectorized picture where you take a, take some, operator and you express it as a column vector and then the matrix you construct is just a vector act, is a matrix acting on that vector and the relationship between this uh, linear algebraic picture and the poly Krauss picture is given by this simple relationship so the eigenvalues of the poly transfer matrix are just these simple linear combinations of the poly Krauss probabilities and that's the that's the rosetta zone to, to go between these two pictures so now I'm gonna show you some data and this is gonna be a preview. So what I'm gonna do is just show you ion trap data and, and a superdiving qubit data where we've applied these tools. Uh, the results are disturbing and I'm gonna give you a preview of the results as a way to kind of you know, motivate the talk and why you should pay attention. So here what we do is we choose a hard cycle that's the identity operation. So what that means is that the, the, the pink block earlier is just do nothing. And then the only errors we're gonna pick up are the errors on the single qubit twirling gates. Now, these are independent gates acting on independent qubits. And so you, you would expect the errors to be one small and two independent. So this is a four qubit experiment from data way back from 2017, which we have not published. And what we're showing here is the reconstructing the error rates, the poly errors in this poly Krauss picture via cycle benchmarking. And the most remarkable thing about this figure is that if you look at the, the blue bars, so we're, we're, we're on the x-axis, we're listing different poly errors, different poly error modes. And on the y-axis, we're showing the probability of that error mode occurring. Now this data is a gold mine for the engineering teams to understand where, is, where are things going wrong, what's going wrong in the device. But just to give a high level description, to people who aren't in the weeds there, notice that the blue bars are one body errors. So this is just an X error. The dominant error is just an X error on qubit one. The next dominant error at 0.3% probability is, um, or is that, yeah, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is um, an X error on the fourth qubit and so on. And then in, in orange, you have two body errors. So the two body errors are, um, if the errors are independent, then the two body errors should be quadratically suppressed relative to the one body errors. So if you have one body errors on the, on the scale 10 to the minus three, your two body errors should be on the scale 10 to the minus six if they're independent. And that just follows from simple probability theory. And the three body errors should be, you know, the 10 to the minus nine. Okay, but, but that's not what's happening here. What you're seeing here is the two body errors are a factor of three smaller rather than 10 to the minus three smaller. And you even see weight four errors. And this is because of the fact that um, there are very strong correlated errors even when the molmer sorensen gate is turned off. So there's no entangling gate happening in this experiment. And you see very strong four body errors even. And so that suggests that the errors are not independent and it, it, this probably comes from the way the, IONS, the, the Innsbruck team does their single qubit gates. So that's important information about the viability of that approach 
for generating independent errors. Um, even more interesting is this data from the IBM Q Yorktown 5 qubit chip, where what we're doing here is we're doing a C naught on qubits 0, 1, which is circled in blue, and we're idling qubits 2, 3, and 4. That's what the hard cycle is. And then, of course, the experiment itself involves applying single qubit polygates randomly uh, in the sequence. So we're seeing the errors. The C naught, of course, dominates the errors. Um, and, and so the errors from the idling qubits are negligible on the scale. Uh, sorry, the errors from the single qubit twirling are negligible. The errors on the idle qubits are not ne negligible, and that's the story of this slide. That um, what we're labeling here are different. So this data set is huge. So on five qubits, you have a, a two to the twenty, uh, two to the four n. So two to the twenty dimensional matrix. And here we're just looking at a marginalization of the data. Um, the, each of these x-axis columns. Each of these columns labeled by the x-axis is looking at different pairs of qubits, qubit 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 3, 1, 4, so on. And the y-axis is the different poly operators in the, in the, as a basis of the error channel. So where are errors occurring? And then this color scale is telling you the strength of the error. So yellow and green are very strong errors. These are at the 10% level. And dark blue is at the, as at the, are the low errors, and these are at the 1% um, level. So what you see is that the first column is very dark blue. And what that's telling you is that IBM did a great job of tuning up its C-naught gate. And they did that by only looking at the qubits in the C-naught gate, and they get the errors they report on their website, whatever it is, 10 to the minus two error rates under randomized benchmarking, where they're just looking here. But what's happening across the rest of the chip is it's lit up like a Christmas tree. So you have, errors induced on the idling qubits from the control sequence for the C naught. Remember the, the cross resonance gate is a very strong pulse. And so what's happening is the qubits that are supposed to be idling are getting very strong errors of the order 10%. And what, that, what turns out most of these errors are actually phase errors. So the bad news is the off gate errors are 10 times bigger than the errors they've reduced through calibration. So that's going to limit your algorithm performance. The good news is that these are phase errors, which will be corrected by the user in a very trivial way I'll describe later. So that's the heads up. That's the preview. Now let's take a bit of a deeper dive. So, um, so uh, some key figures of merit. This is something most of you know well. Uh, you can have talk about an average gate fidelity. Um, you can talk about the infidelity, which is one minus the average gate fidelity. Uh, that's what's measured by randomized benchmarking. Um, you can talk about the diamond norm for error strength, which is commonly used in fault tolerance. And you can talk about the total variational distance on the output probability distributions. This impacts kind of how well did your algorithm work typically. You run the circuit, you get a noisy distribution, and you compare it to the true distribution, and you measure the distance between these probabilities. Um, the important story here is that control errors are much more um, problematic than I think most people realize. And the reason for that is that um, norm-based measures of error, such as the diamond norm and such as the total variational distance, which is ultimately telling you how well did your algorithm run, um, are very sensitive to control errors. So you can bound the diamond norm and the total variational distance. You can upper and lower bound it by the numbers you measure via randomized benchmarking. So now forget about the off-gate errors. Just assume you're doing, you're just interested in in, in uh, errors estimated by a randomized benchmarking, that gives you very little information, not only about the idle errors, but also gives you very in little information about these norm-based errors. And the reason for that is that the upper bound on the diamond norm and the total variational distance is given by the square root of the infidelity times the dimensional factor of order of the Hilbert space. So what that means is if you're measuring error rates at 10 to the minus four scale, and you don't know if they're coherent or not, you don't know what type of error it is, you just know that there is an error, then the best you can guarantee is that the, you bound the diamond norm by the square root of that. So that means now all of a sudden, if you have a fault tolerant threshold of 10 to the minus three, you thought you were passing it, but really you're not passing that threshold because you can only certify a 10 to the minus two bound on the diamond norm with that randomized benchmarking number. So how do we fix that problem? We fix it from randomized compiling. So randomized compiling, what it does is it's a, it, it adds uh, little to no circuit depth. 
by inserting virtual gates and averaging over different random versions of the same circuit. And by doing that, it converts coherent errors into stochastic errors. So I should have mentioned on the previous slide, this lower bound where the diamond norm is linearly proportional to the infidelity with a dimensional factor of order one, that's saturated by stochastic errors, so-called poly channels, poly error channels. The upper bound with the square root is saturated by control errors or, or, or calibration errors. So what we wanna do is we wanna turn a calibration error into a control error the RB infidelity will be the same, but the, um, the, uh, the, the understanding of the, of the diamond norm will be different. I see there's some chat questions. Let me, um, all right. Okay. So anyways, randomized compiling, this is basically showing that it works, it reduces coherent errors, it reduces the overall total variational distance. I'm running low on time, so let me skip through this. Very few randomizations are required, basically order 10. Uh, here's data from IBMQ showing how well randomized compiling reduces the error profile and creates a more stable performance. And so that's the story there. This slide I've already shown you, I was just gonna talk more about it. I was gonna walk you through the IBM chip this is kind of explaining what I explained at the beginning. The point is randomized benchmarking gives you a, an expected error rate of 0.02, but the true errors give you an error rate of 0.2, so 20% rather than 2%, um, and that we can correct these errors. So here's the exciting part here, is that we can overcome these dominant errors with what we call error adaptive compiling. So this is something we've built into our software system, and it, it gives dramatically different application performance. So here, what we've done is we've run on the IBM Q London chip. We're running a C naught on qubits three and four and idling qubits zero, one, and two. And what we're plotting here in the first column is the total infidelity of the entire, uh, uh, across the entire five qubit system goes from a 40% error rate to a 20% error rate via this error adaptive compiling tool we've developed using this diagnostic data. So you can get much better application performance. And the way this basically works is you identify the phase errors that are dominating the error budget on IBM systems. Um, some of these phase errors correspond to a 30 degree rotation. That's how big they are. And then what you do is you just sweep through for each distinct, uh, each distinct combination of CNOT gates you wanna run, you sweep through corrections until you find the minimum uh, Z phase, Z compensation angle. And then what you do is when you're running the application, in the next cycle, you implement the negative rotation of what you've identified to compensate for it. So it's a very easy bookkeeping method, which is done automatically with the software and, and, and gives this benefit. And so what we can do is then, is then um, you know, basically adapt to the specific error profiles in each gate set and include that in a software layer to improve performance. Uh, just quickly wrapping up, this is just some data we characterized. If you look at all the five qubit chips IBM just put out, you've got Burlington, Essex, London, Urents, and Vigo. We did Urents twice on two different days. And the point is, these are the only allowed C0 gate combinations based on restrictions from the hardware design. So you have this T-type geometry or topology. You can have a two qubit gate on the leftmost end of the T, on the rightmost T, the top of the T, the bottom of the T, and you can do these two parallel C0 combinations. And what we're plotting here is the fidelity of, or the infidelity of each of these distinct gate sets. So not only can you overcome the errors via that trick I just described on the previous slide, you can also understand which gate combinations give you the best performance before and after that correction and add another layer of circuit design to, to you know, minimize the impact of the worst case gate combinations. So this buys pretty tremendous efficiencies for application co-design on hardware. Um, and uh, here what we're doing is assessing these different chips against each other. We're showing a bound on uh, the guarantee that the, that the application produces the correct solution. We can bound the probability of getting the right bit string out from these diagnostics as circuit depth increases. And here you see um, that, uh, that Vigo is the clear winner in terms of the best guarantees of getting the right solution uh, via applying all of our tools. And this allows, this is interesting because 
you know, with the announce Google's announcements and other announcements from other companies, we're soon going to be in this regime where we have chips that are running computations that are so big that we can't directly check if the answers are correct anymore via classical processing. So what we can do here is now provide a certification of the probability that you got the right bit string by looking simultaneously at the error profile of the hardware and how that application responded to those errors via the cycle benchmarking tool. So it allows us to certify the accuracy of the output in this regime, which I call the quantum discovery regime, where we can't check if the solution was correct. Okay, great. That ends my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Joe. Um, as a, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Joe, you should be posting them in the Slack channel. Um, so we have a, one question to start with, which is um, from Boris Vabanov, which is, is this benchmarking protocol sensitive to both ZZ crosstalk and cross-driving errors? Is there a way to separate between the two sources? Yeah, so that's a great question. In fact, that's something we were working on very hard, which is these error diagnostics are like fingerprints. And so you get this incredibly detailed information like you have in a fingerprint. And then, uh, and then the interesting research problem is once you have this diagnostic data, it's doing the detective work. And so, so first answer, yes, it does see all of these errors and they each have a distinct fingerprint. And then the interesting research challenge is then constructing a mapping between what the experimentalists think their dominant error mechanisms are, you know, you know, laser fluctuations, whatever it is, um, you know, frequency collisions uh, between certain qubits. And then uh, what we can do is we can then construct a predictive um, fingerprint of each of those error mechanisms and then map that onto the data and say, okay, well, actually, you know, you had these three error mechanisms. It turns out for this gate sequence, error mechanism two is the dominant one. And for this gate sequence, error mechanism one is the dominant one. So, so that's, that's the fun part is constructing that map. Okay, so we then have a question from Ling Ling Lao. Can you explain the error adaptive compiling a bit? Does it include some techniques in this talk? Um, does it, uh, oh yeah, so you know, where does it go? Look, the business landscape is, um, the business landscape is, is, is shifting all the, t the time. This is such a nascent field and, uh, and you know, you know, where it goes is a business question. Uh, right now, uh, we're finding that um, users are using our tool set as a, as a compiler tool, which they can apply in-house and, and then run on whatever hardware they want. Um, you know, whether that eventually ships to the, the, the vendors want to just offer this as an OEM solution, we'll see how it goes. Um, that would make my life easier for sure. <laughs> If you were customers. <laughs> so uh, David Amaro asks, does cycle benchmarking detect qubit loss? Um, okay, yeah, that's a good, so qubit loss. Well, so you could, I, I guess trivially you detect qubit loss by not getting a click in your detector. Um, so maybe the question needs to be more refined because it's easy to detect if you've had qubit loss. Um, can we measure directly leakage rates is another question that's closely related. Maybe that was the question. Um, so yes, we, cycle benchmarking is not the right tool for detecting leakage rates, but we have a separate tool for that, which we call XRB, and that detects leakage rates uh, in the system. Uh, Konstantinos Georgopoulos asks, can cycle benchmarking tell if an error is due to qubit decay or gate infidelity? Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess if I qubit decay, maybe they mean, so look, the way I, okay, the way I would ask a question like that is we have a variety of different error mechanisms. Some are due to background interactions with the environment, which are like decoherence type mechanisms like T1 and T2 processes. Other error models are based really on the control. They can be static or systematic errors you're trying to do a 90 degree rotation, you do a 91 degree rotation uh, because of miscalibrations of the, of the, of the pulse. Um, or same similarly for a CNOT gate, instead of it being 
you know, a pi C naught gate, it's a pi plus epsilon. Uh, so I crudely divide these, camp, these errors into those two camps. It's much more sophisticated than that. Um, I know I give a whole grad course on this, um, but uh, yeah, so it, it can distinguish them, but it, it, uh, you need extra information. You need to know what kind of control error you expect. Uh, there's, there, there's an interplay between the physics and the diagnostic tool. So in a sense, the diagnostic tool can detect all of the information. The, the problem is there's some degeneracies in mapping that information onto the different possible sources. So there's a little bit of research that has to be done to vary parameters to tease out which one is leading to that error profile. I, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Uh, so Earl Campbell asks, you said that the York turn C not gate on zero one qubits had tuned the control pulses to work well only on qubit zero and one. You had a solution so it worked better on all the qubits, but it sounds like you used the IBM choice of control pulse. Is there hope of a better control pulse that would give a much better fidelity across the whole chip? Yeah, exactly. So thanks, Earl, for the question. Um, the, uh, the answer is it depends. So it turns out that um, there are experimental constraints which make it so that even errors that the experimentalists know about, they just can't get rid of. So it might be that, you know, we think about correlations as due to spatial, you know, the naive thing is, you know, qubits that are spatially proximate will have crosstalk. Uh, but it turns out that often it's a frequency collision problem. So qubits elsewhere on the chip are at the same resonance frequency as the qubits you're trying to address. And there are bandwidth issues so that even if the experimentalists know about the problem, they can't get rid of it because of just constraints on the experimental design. And um, in fact, what you even see with that data I showed for the five different chips, these chips were all generated by the same fabrication process. These are exactly the same chip from a fab point of view, but what the fab sp system spot out, spat out were uh, you know, variable frequencies. So each, fre each you know, they can't completely control the fab process. And so you get distinct re collisions, frequency collisions for each chip spat out by that process. Um, so the answer is that uh, yes, um, they can remove some of these errors, but ultimately it's gonna fall on the users to adapt their algorithms to compensate for the errors, the, especially the systematic control errors that can't be removed via pulse design. Thank you very much. So I think we'll draw this session to a close at this point. There are still a couple of questions, a few questions left on Slack if you'd like to go and answer those after the session. Um, just as a reminder, the next session will take place in just over an hour's time. Um, in that time, do make use of the chance to go and look at the posters again and ask any questions you might have of the posters. And I'm sure you will all join me in thanking Joseph again for his great talk. Thank all right. You. Thanks, everyone.